All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Josh. That's about all I have to say about me. Um, now, about the session. Can you, can you all hear? Yeah. Um, I often um, accidentally embed cryptic messages in my um, slides, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. In this particular case, I'm going to be completely upfront and say the first person who gets what this talk is actually about will win a prize. They'll win an iPhone, in fact. Now, is that what's in the Macintosh? Oh, uh, well, we'll get to see inside the Macintosh later. But um, anyway, because this talk is titled Inside Macintosh, um, it's not the only thing that's called Inside Macintosh. There was actually uh, the, the, program, the developer guide for Macintosh back in the 80s was called Inside Macintosh, and it was originally produced in three volumes. Um, of physical dead tree books. Um, they were typeset on uh, Apple, they were printed with a laser writer, and that, that, that became the, the direct ancestor and the set the future direction for like the Apple Direct Developer Connection and all the online and Xcode documentation that you read today. Um, so I'm not going to cover um, the story of how Inside Macintosh came to be written, um, but I did feel the need to um, put it in my talk um, because putting inside Macintosh, inside, inside Macintosh was a good meme. Um, I would just stress again that this is a, a physical book that you could buy from Madison Wesley. It was copyrighted and published and so on and had a number of interesting authors, um, which you can, and you can read about the, the history of that on um, sites like folklore.org. Um, so point zero I want to wish to make is that it doesn't have to be a book, but you should really write something. Um, the, the first thing I want to note about the book is actually um, comes from the preface of the book. The book tries to set the um, tone of the documentation. Um, the first words you read, it's literally trying to tell you that this is not the same computer you're used to programming. It's, you're supposed to respond to user input, may come in a different order than you expect. Um, it's not just a, a, a list of, your program is not a sequence of instructions. It's gonna, it's gonna respond to things out of order and that sort of thing. Just scratching my head thinking, wow, I've heard this before. Actually, back when we were first learning how to program the iPhone, and the iPhone had a completely different metaphor to um, desktop programming at the time. So you're, with a phone, you're supposed to go back to like, having only one app open at a time and um, worry about um, you know, memory and small screen constraints and that sort of thing. So it's not the first time uh, I've heard this. Um, anyway, point one I want to make is that you should really set expectations up front. Put effort into your front matter, whether it's the Preface, the roadmap, um, or chapter introductions, or section headings, it's all really important. Um, another little tidbit that I found was this um, from volume three, where it uh, talks about the mouse. Um, so this is technical documentation. It's not telling you what a mouse is. Um, by this point, people have seen a Macintosh and kind of played with it and got the idea. But if you're a developer, you kind of want to know, OK, so can I make a mouse myself? Can I, what, what signals does it send? If I need to debug the mouse, what do I do? And the text here is not what I wish to point out, although it's useful to know that it's electrically identical to the Apple II, III mouse. Um, if you're uh, um, after like, a good example of some documentation, consider looking at the diagram. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is also from, you know, it follows, it's on, on the immediately next page, it's, it shows um, how the uh, Apple um, and Mac original Macintosh mice is a pretty simple device. So it pays to have clear diagrams. Even for things that seem a bit uh, more abstract. So here we have a function called munger. And we know it, you say the word munger that way because it literally says rhymes with plunger. Important to know. <laughs> However, what it's doing is find and replace. So you know, all these pointers coming along, these handles, offsets, what it's, it might seem a bit um, strange and you might not see what it's doing straight away unless you have a diagram. So this is the accompanying diagram for the Munger function. And you can see that if you start at offset four and you have two other strings, the and an, and it'll go in and replace, there's the apple with there's an apple and give you a return of where it finished the replacement. Even simple things need diagrams. However, some things do not need diagrams. Here's another excerpt from Inside Macintosh. These are values that you give to the sound driver if you want to synthesize specific notes. And not only have they given um, just a simple scale, but they've given uh, seven octaves worth of notes in both 
uh, just intonation and, and equal temperament. In case you want to do nicely tuned songs in a particular key or songs in any random key. This is not good material for a diagram. So it's best to use something like a table. And where do you put a table? Well, a long table, probably an appendix. Those are the um, main things I wanted to point out about Inside Macintosh, the document. However, it's a very good read, and if you read it, I've been reading it a bit for reasons that I'll get to later. Um, if you read it, you'll see not only where did um, all the, the Apple developer stuff come from, like, well, it still has the same structure, like you have an introduction to the chapter and then it goes into the, some of the details, that sort of thing, um, but it's also really good technical writing. Does anyone know what I'm talking about in this talk? Writing good documentation. Yes. Here's your iPhone. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> this was that iPhone. <laughs> um, and in fact, that's not even all the iPhone. I don't have the rest of it yet. Um, so uh, we have an empty block next to our apartment. Um, and it was just filling up with sand and it has fences around it, you know, do not go here. And one day we looked out the window and thought, oh, well, something square and rectangular and shiny down there. I wonder what it is. It turns out it was an iPhone 6 that someone had chucked over the fence. The screen was completely busted and it started sinking into the sand. So here, is, here it is um, just after I popped it open. Um, anyway, so congratulations. You are today's winner. Okay, so onto the plus. Yeah, Mac Plus. I promised the insides of a Mac Plus in this talk, and that's what you're going to get, um, but not without a bit of um, pretext setting it up. So um, Apple advertised the Mac Plus like this, uh, with a lot of text, and um, they proudly pronounced it had SCSI, uh, whatever that is. Um, here it is, proving that it works. And here I have to be um, uh, utterly forthright again. While I was um, watching Russell's and um, Mark's Keynote, I had left the Mac Plus on outside the registration desk and during that time it stopped working. The, de the demo gods decided to spit in my face after, well, I spat in their face last year I suppose. <laughs> so like, I don't know why it's broken but we're going to find out today or at least have a shot at it. Which is fortunate because I was planning on opening up in front of you anyway. Um, so, first, a little bit of history about the Mac Plus. It's um, the longest ceiling. Um, it, is, it is the third Macintosh. Um, the first one was the 128K, and then it was followed by the 512K. Um, it's got either one of these models numbers, M1A or AP. The P just signifies it was either the European or the education market. So apparently, Australia's in Europe. <laughs> um, they sold from the start of 86 to late 1990, um, which makes it the longest selling, I'm going to learn how to say English, um, the longest selling single model of Mac, um, which I believe is still the case. Mac Pro, Mac Pro maybe, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, talking about Mac Pro, it's uh, actually priced around the same point when it first came out. Um, the reason it sold so long was because they discounted it. They had, made, they had made a lot and they discounted it and they'd sold it as kind of a base model for many years. Even though they had the Macintosh 2 and the Macintosh SE that all came out 87, you know, it kept selling. So people, so Apple kept selling it. So. Um, it supports down to system 3.0, but um, with 4 megs of RAM, you can get uh, system 755 working, which is one of the um, earlier ones that were labeled as Mac OS. Um, the first official Mac OS was 7.6, but 7.5 um, boots with a little Mac OS screen that you see in later versions. Um, and yeah, it can be a bit slug sluggish on those later versions, so yeah, I, I would like to show it off, but it's a bit, a bit busted at the moment. Um, some things the Mac Plus first did on the Macintosh line was the first with the SCSI. SCSI is in square, scare quotes because it, doesn't, it was um, released in the time when SCSI was being standardised for the first time. And so it did a few things that the standard actually went, oh, actually, we're going to implement with this other command. So it can be a little funny. I'll get onto that a bit later. Um, it was first released initially with one meg of RAM and also upgradable to two and a half or four megs of RAM. 
Um, and it was also the first Mac with a double-sided 800 kilobyte floppy drive, which was um, double as in you know, twice 400, which was the original. Uh, but it was backwards compatible. Um, so last year I brought in a Mac Classic. Um, here is the two of them side by side. On the left is the Classic, on the right is the Plus. Um, they look pretty similar. Obviously the Classic has a bit of a stripe happening in the um, front of it and the Plus has a nice chamfered bezel there. But um, uh, you get a much clearer difference of the, the two when you look from the top. So the Classic on the left has a, a curved front whereas the Plus is a very straight front. The Plus has also got these air vents in the top. The reason it has air vents and not the Classic is because the Mac Plus doesn't have an internal fan. I'll get onto that again in a minute. The um, reason they also have slightly different color variation, um, this particular Mac Plus is from just after they changed to the, the platinum style color that they used in the Classic and, and so on. So the difference in color is, in this case, is due to the amount of UV light it's had over the years. So you, if you leave a Mac in the window for a long time, it'll go brown. Um, but that's not the only classic that I have. Um, between Last Deaf World and this one, I also acquired a color classic. Um, and I put that in scare quotes for another reason, which I'll cover later. So there's the three of them all next to one another. Um, from the top, you can see that the color classic is even bigger, uh, maintains the curved front, um, but still has more or less the same size. It's got the handle in the top, and it's about the, about the same depth, about the same width. Um, some other things that the Plus did that uh, you don't see in newer Macs, we have here the keyboard connector. It's in the front of the Mac, which is a bit weird. And it's also a RJ11 phone style connection, which is convenient if you need to dig up a new plug for it. Maybe I did, I don't know. Um, it's also the last Mac with this um, DB9 connector mouse, um, matching the diagram that I showed you earlier. Um, starting with the SE, um, and the Macintosh 2, Apple used uh, the Apple desktop bus. So I, last year I brought in some of those devices, which was fun. Um, but it was not the last Mac with the uh, analog screen brightness knob. The SE kept that. So um, point three in my documentation um, talk is uh, great icons transcend verbiage, but beware that even modestly good icons need some text. It may not be clear that what you're looking at is a screen brightness knob. It may literally be a knob for adjusting the brightness of the sun. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Some other potential lasts for the Macintosh Plus. Um, is it the last Mac without an internal cooling fan? All the initial, right. So if you consider the iPhone to be a Mac, that didn't have an internal fan. The uh, 2015 MacBook lost the internal cooling fan. So it wasn't the last, but it was definitely the last of the compact Mac line that did had, a, had no internal fan. Another thing that it might not um, have had the last of is an internal hard disk. Um, this is a bit, uh, bit more dubious. Well, you could buy an, a Macintosh SE with two floppies um, and no hard, internal hard disk, um, but it was offered with an internal hard disk, so yeah. You could also take the argument that SSDs aren't hard disks. I don't know. <laughs> But there's one thing that I, I do want to show you that the Macintosh Plus is basically the last of, um, which is a bit hard to uh, take a photo of, or as, at least I found it annoying. And we'll be taking the lid off anyway, so I get to show you. Um, now, this particular model here um, was from 1988, and it was built in Fremont, California. Um, I didn't know this until today. Um, the design of the logic board and the case is from 1987, so the, the platinum refresh. Um, it was found on the side of the road in Sydney. And um, it's kind of a miracle that um, it worked, but um, it did. Um, it was found by a colleague of mine called Max, and he's like, hey, yeah, I found two of these. He found two Max, his name's Max. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna like, get on with it. So, here we have the Mac Plus. And um, first I'm gonna unplug the keyboard. And I'm going to unplug the mouse, and I'm going to unplug this thing that I'm going to talk about later. Um, now, uh, before I continue, who knows, uh, put your hand up if you know where the defibrillator is in the building. Who knows CPR? Uh, I point 
I appoint my girlfriend to give me CPR. <laughs> um, I'm not going to expose anyone to undue danger in any way. Just be um, mindful that even though I have completely unplugged it, step number one, never open uh, main circuitry unless you've unplugged it physically. Um, it can still bite because it's got a cathode ray tube in there. It's probably still charged even though it was malfunctioning before. So, uh, battery cover off. Um, so now all five screws are um, exposed. So here's the back of it. One, two, three, four, and five in there. And this is why you need a long screwdriver because you need to get in here to get these screws. Particularly interesting, so I'm just going to like um, sing something for you. Just going to get any requests. No. Do you have a spare battery for that? Spare battery. I'll talk about that in a minute. Sometimes they don't start up. That's true, but this sound sounded. Um, yeah. So the from the audience it said. Um, he said, uh, sometimes I don't start up without a battery. Um, I do have a battery in here, so it should have started up. But even then, it sounded like there was a, some kind of lone capacitor on the uh, power supply or something. So we'll find out in just a second. Okay, five screws off. <coughs> if you've already taken the lid off one of these before, it's pretty easy. You just... Okay, now, pass this around. And have a look on the inside. They used to be really, really tight to get apart. I mean, there was a special tool called the Mac one. Yeah. So, so like a lever. Yeah. 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 When 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 they're hard to get apart, the the tool you need is like a, called a cracker. Um, I don't need one of those because I've already taken it apart. Um, here's the little protective film off the bottom of the logic board. So there's that. Um, and here's the insides of it. Um, so while the back cases are being passed around, I'm going to point out, I'm just going to say two things about it. Um, so one is you may notice the inside is metallic coloured. It's conductive. Um, the reason it's conductive is because you, they wanted it to be a Faraday cage to stop RF radiation leaking out the back of it. And the second thing you'll see is a bunch of signatures moulded into the plastic. Um, when uh, Apple first released the Macintosh 128K, it had all the Macintosh, basically a whole bunch of Macintosh creators and some other people that are involved in the project. Uh, had the signatures modeled into the back. As time went on and uh, more models were released, um, they had to make some pragmatic changes to the plastic molding. And it was expensive to keep putting the signatures back in, so some of them got, got dropped over time. So you see some of the signatures there, but not all of them. OK. Now, I wonder what's busted. Um, hmm. It's not really clear. I just point out. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so dangerous things that um, you might want, want to touch if you find one of these open. The yoke at the back of the cathode ray tube here, that tends to be charged. The, this red wire here connecting the flyback transformer, that also tends to be highly charged. Some of these power supply bits and pieces can also be highly charged, um, even while it's unplugged, so I'm not going to touch any of those. Uh, but if any of you want to come up here and have a look that's closer, feel free to. Um, still, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to unplug this. So that was the uh, floppy drive cable and this crunch. Uh, so that I can just slide out the logic board. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my static strap, indeed? So here we have the logic board. Okay, so I'm just going to plow on with these slides. So, um, yeah, so that I gave a hazard warning. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not this bad. It, um, some people will say it's just a shock, but other people will say, no, this will really will actually probably kill you. Um, so anyway, uh, point four in my documentation talk is artists sign their work especially for this work that they're proud of. Um, that's evidence in the back of the case there. And finally, five, um, you should re really guard against non-obvious hazards, like by putting a plastic case in front of it. Um, but if you can't, then always clearly label the hazards. So there's that big lightning bolt symbol on the side there. 
Um, oh, uh, on the topic of the case being conductive, that's the reason why this piece of cardboard exists. Because if the, um, if the solder on the back of this um, circuit board comes into contact, it'll shorten. Yeah. So, anyway, so the repair. So I did actually get this Mac Plus to work for a while. Um, it did require a little bit of work. So here's all the stuff I had to do. Um, I always had to clean the case a bit because it was out in the rain in Sydney. Um, the floppy drive is rusted shut um, and doesn't work. Um, it didn't come with a mouse. Um, the keyboard um, was there, but there was no keyboard cable that came with it, this thing. Um, there was a hard disk that was uh, with it, but there was no cable for connecting that either, um, or even a terminator. And it was unclear whether that still worked. And there was no, um, there was a battery in it, but it was dead. There's this battery here. So on these, each of these things, um, I'll give a brief talk, but um, first another meme. Uh, at least I have the screwdriver, so that I had that going for me, which was nice. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, it did this. Um, so this is always a good sign. If it doesn't say Mac, then you've probably got a pretty decent machine. Um, so I gathered some parts, my shopping to-do list. I needed to get a mouse, obviously. I needed to get some more cables or make a cable. Um, need a new battery and anything else? Well, I guess I need to fix it again, so we'll find out. Um, there was a guy, he sold me a mouse. He was on Gumtree. It's interesting, he, he said, when I, when I told him the shipping address was Google Office, I was, he's like, oh, I didn't know Google were into old Mac stuff. And I'm like, no, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but you can, if you're in a real pinch, um, take a, hack up a PS2 ball mouse and you, because it's such a simple, the Macintosh mouse is such a simple device, you can just use the, the quadrature encoders in the same way. Um, here's the bottom of it, so it's uh, model M100 and it was made in Japan. So, cool. uh, next thing, something to boot off. Can I boot off the floppy drive? Well, no, it doesn't work. I um, pulled it apart, I pulled the boards apart, I discharged it, I pulled the floppy drive out. I got it to this point and I looked up some guides in cleaning it, so I pulled it apart even further and cleaned it and greased it and so on and so forth and put it back all back together, but it still doesn't work. At least compared to when uh, I first tried to boot it on and the floppy drive, base, the motor sensor basically got stuck and constantly trying to eject something, at least now it's silent. So I had, it's an improvement, I guess. <laughs> um, Here's the hard drive. It's big and heavy and doesn't work, so I didn't bring it. Um, but it's manufactured by Western Digital and is whopping 20 megabytes. <laughs> um, if it works. It's obviously zero bytes now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's the back of it. So you can see there's uh, two SCSI connectors. Um, the idea with SCSI is you can chain devices. Um, you can have like six devices or something in a chain, theoretically. Um, so you use one of those, um, it's like, plugs from the computer into the, one of these connectors and the other one can plug into the next device and so on and so forth. Until the last one where you need a, a special terminator to stop signal reflection interfering with the signals that you want to send. Um, modern devices don't need a special terminator, they just self-terminate. Um, so, I, with no hard drive and no floppy disk, I need an alternative boot solution. And what are the options for that? Well, there's this thing called SCSI 2SD. It lets you mount a uh, image off a SCSI disk, um, sorry, an image off a, a SD card and pretend it's a SCSI disk. Um, this one, well, due to reasons related to the Mac Plus not conforming to the actual SCSI standard, not actually boot, um, but it does mount. So if you have previously booted from a floppy disk or something, it'll mount. So that, that could be useful, but I didn't end up getting one of those. Um, Big Mess of Wires has a thing called a Mac Rominator. Uh, this comes in a different, um, different flavors depending on what Mac you have. For the early Macs, it comes in this two chip form that sort of slots onto the, um, the ROM chips here. And you can do all sorts of things like replace the happy Mac at the beginning with a custom icon. You can add, add more memory. You can boot off an image that's built into this augmented ROM. Uh, I didn't mess with that one though. The one I uh, put in the end was called Floppy Emu, also by Big Mess of Wires. It's this. And it plugs into the external floppy port. And what it does is it's got this little screen and a few buttons and lets you pick a disk image to mount. Um, it can do floppy disks for um, Apple II, Lisa, and Macintosh, and also uh, pretend to be the Apple HD20, which was Apple's own 
external hard disk solution that used the same external floppy port. So when it was um, running before outside, that's what it was boost, um, booted off. It was booted off a fake external hard disk from this thing. Um, so you can come and have a look at that if you like. Um, it's all there. Feel free to come, come and have a look. Um, some notes about cleaning the keyboard. Um, here's what the grime looked like um, when I first got some of the keys off. You can see the grime had sort of risen up halfway um, some of the keys. A bit of isopropyl alcohol took care of that once I got the keys keycaps off. I found evidence of at least one spilled beverage in this thing. Here it is after cleaning. You'll notice that there's still some rust. Um, it's just hard to get rid of that. Um, and here's the opposite side of um, the keyboard board. Um, the only adjustment I had to make here was resoldering some of the connectors, especially on the phone connector, because they had started to wiggle a bit. Um, but yeah, no, I uh, got together a cable. Oh, this, this was a ho phone handset cable. Um, but beware, um, they deliberately wired the Macintosh keyboard cable the wrong way around. So I had to recrimp one of the ends. After, after figuring that out, um, it worked. Um, here's a close-up of the logic board pre-cleaning. Um, so there's a bit of dust there. Um, you can see where I had touched the CPU and so on. It's like, ah. Oh. Uh, and here it is after cleaning, and I'm going to point out some of the parts. So there's the SCSI controller. There's a, a resistor I pointed out, a crystal that I pointed out, the ROM, the CPU, and the RAM. The ROM is what it um, obviously runs when you turn it on. The RAM is where it has temporary memory and the CPU is the old style. It's all old style through hole components. So you can see on the bottom here there's solder points uh, rather than the newer models which have surface mount components. Um, so it's a lot easier to maintain in, in that respect. You can just desolder components, rip them out, and put new ones through the holes. Um, I pointed out this resistor for a reason that you need to snip it if you want to upgrade the RAM from the small chips to the large ones. So here you can actually see that I've cut this resistor, and there it is, wiggling around. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. Um, uh, the second thing, I pointed out the crystal there, that actually drives the timing for the whole machine. Um, newer, newer computers have just asynchronous bits and pieces happening all over the show, but the early Macintosh is all driven off. Everything from the, the CPU, the RAM, the bus, and the, the video even is based on the timing from this one chip. It's a 15.6672 megahertz crystal. The CPU runs at half that frequency. You get the idea. Um, here's some more close-up pictures of the hazard signs and so on, which you can just see. Um, now, about the clock battery. Here it is, um, up close. It says Energizer. Oh, that's cool. I can go down to the supermarket and buy an Energizer. <laughs> No, no, this is a 4.5 volt energizer. <laughs> Number 5523. Five, hmm, where am I going to get one of those? Well, I couldn't uh, find one in Battery World or Officeworks or Woolworths or Coles or IGA or. So, and now even JCar doesn't have something like this anymore. So, what do I do? Well, there's a few options. I could try and ship one from overseas, but they wouldn't ship one to me because it's a battery. <laughs> <laughs> In the end, what I did was a bit of DIY. <laughs> <laughs> so you can buy you can buy quad A size batteries. Did you know this? I didn't know this until I, I saw them in office works. Like, yes, this will work. So I got uh, three of them together and I taped them up and I attached the ends together and hey presto, I got 4.5 volts and it fits in the right end slot. So, <laughs> so since it's not booting up, I'll just take it out. So there it is. Wow. Oh. <laughs> um, don't solder batteries together, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing bad happened, but just, just, just warning you. Um, some remaining problems with the Mac, um, obviously other than the fact it doesn't boot anymore. <laughs> um, the sound is broken. The speaker in the side. It's, the speaker is um, in here. It's in here. You can sort of can't really see where I'm pointing. It's in here. Oh, this grill. And um, the speaker itself appears to be busted, like something went wrong with it and it's gum or something. Um, there's some bits of rust in there. Uh, obviously the floppy drive still doesn't work. So, okay. We've still got a bit of repair to go. Um, now I wanted to give you some 
other practical information rather than just, hey, here's how you do good technical documentation and also here's the inside of the Mac. So I thought I'd talk a bit about emulators because I've been playing a lot with emulators. Um, no talk about emulators would be complete without mentioning Basilisk 2. Or Sheep Shaver. Um, Basilisk 2 is a 68K Mac emulator, so it's sort of anything from this um, vintage onwards um, to um, Sheep Shaver, which is a PowerPC based Mac emulator. Um, these are really featureful and performant, but unfortunately the developers stopped working on it in 2009. So you're probably going to have a lot of um, trouble getting it working nicely on Mac OS. It does still work pretty well on Windows and Linux though. Um, the one I use the most is Mini VMac. It's great, it's very stable, um, and it aims to uh, very accurately replicate the timing behavior of um, a Mac Plus, in fact, which is perfect for what I want. Um, it supports a huge number of platforms that it runs on. It runs on Mac OS, Windows, Linux, Mac OS Classic. Um, you can even run it on a 68K Mac itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, like four different versions of BSD, it does Open Indiana, and even Windows Mobile 5. Um, some drawbacks of Mini VMac, however, are it's very limited to the types of machines it's trying to emulate. It does a Mac Plus, it does a Macintosh 2 if you compile it to do so. Um, it doesn't do any CPU other than 68K or 68020, and the, hard, the memory is limited to 8 megs and this sort of thing. And the thing that really annoys me the most is um, it doesn't um, let you talk through the serial port. It just pretends there's nothing going on there. So um, it's, it's very good, it's actively developed. Um, the beta is very good, especially for Macintosh 2 emulation. Um, there's another emulator which I discovered recently called PCE. Um, this has a, a cult following, sort of a bit more along the Linux lines, but it still works very well on macOS. You can even brew install it. Um, it's GPL version 2. Um, it's a bit more you write a config file and then run it rather than mini vmac which has a few user interface um, conveniences. Um, I haven't played with, around with it much but I'm more on this topic in a minute. Um, a couple of years ago I mentioned Shoebill in a talk I gave at DevWorld. Um, unfortunately Shoebill stopped being um, developed in 2015 um, but still runs okay on Mac OS and uh, the goal of Shoebill was not to emulate um, a Mac that would run the original system software, but to emulate a Mac that would run Apple Unix, and only Apple Unix. Uh, part of the problem was the other Mac emulators didn't do the uh, memory controller correctly, and this does uh, that in a bit more detail. Um, so that's, that's fun. Um, I should mention QMU, um, which is a popular open source emulator for all sorts of things. They recently added PowerPC, so then you can go and run it on whatever. Um, however, it's, it's missing a couple of features like sound, so you know your mileage may vary. So here's a little breakdown of what I think um, each of the emulators is good for. Um, now, some noteworthy emulations um, include running on an Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> it takes two minutes to boot System 7, which really puts the Mac Plus in a positive light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't know. I don't have one. I have a Fitbit. Anyway, um, this PCE emulator, the PCE Mac Plus emulator that I talked about, has been ported to the web and runs in JavaScript. Believe it or not, um, this has been this has been done multiple times. In fact, so James Friend did one, and another guy did one, and I'll talk about it in just a couple of slides. Um, but this was used as the basis for the Internet Archive's Mac software library, and this is beautiful. You can just go to the website and you click on the thing you want, it launches in your browser, and you don't even need to have any special software installed. It's just, it just works, like sound and mouse and keyboard and everything. It's great. Um, here's, here's the other uh, web-based emulator that um, uh, a guy called, actually I can't remember what his name is now, but you can find it. Um, online, um, and in addition to the Mac Plus, it emulates a couple of other old machines. Now, what do you do with an emulator or an old Mac Plus? Well, you could make software for it. You may be wondering why you would want to write software for an, uh, an old machine, and hopefully I gave enough of a rationale last year to get invited to DevWorld to give a talk about it. <laughs> um, but the other reasons are, of course, um, you make use of the Mac that you're probably using as a doorstop, and um, 
you can actually run it in an emulator on basically anything or even on the original hardware if you have it. Some reasons why not, well, the display is tiny and the bit depth is tiny and the sound is tiny in terms of quality. Um, all that emulation is still pretty slow, um, so I'm going to give a brief demo of this in a minute. Um, but um, yeah, it's still a bit faster than the original part of it, which is nice. Um, but the most important thing to think about when you're distributing software that's intended to run an emulator is the emulator provides a layer that might get in the way of your accessibility features. So if you've got a voice, uh, a voiceover feature, say, running, um, it's not going to be able to reach into the emulator that well. Um, not unless you, uh, just my experience anyway. Um, so things you can use to write software for old Macs include it, um, doing it the old school way with the actual original tool chain. So there's MPW. You can still find copies of this floating around the internet, which is nice. Um, or you could use Code Warrior, which also ran this lets you build um, assembler, Pascal, C, C++, and so on programs for the Macintosh. However, it's a really terrible IDE by modern standards. You wouldn't want to uh, inflict just MPW on yourself. Um, one solution to this is this uh, MPW compatibility layer. So this emulates a 68K CPU, kind of like the other emulators, but it's only concentrated on running the MPW toolchain. Um, and that's an interesting approach, but I didn't get it working. Instead, what I found was this thing called Retro 68, and this is amazing. You just build, um, you build, it's basically a GNU, C, C, uh, sorry, GNU compiler collection toolchain, but it cross compiles for um, 68K, Mac, include, you dump in the interfaces and libraries, and it, and it, it works just like you expect it should. And so then you can use your um, whatever fancy idea you have in, in the modern era. Um, some uh, noteworthy projects that uh, uses Retro 68 is this, Browsy, a browser for System 6. Actually, they need to work on the rendering part, but other than that, it's fine. <laughs> some other ideas that I had for um, apps that I could use. Well, last year I did a Twitter client and HyperCard, so okay, fine. Uh, I had a fractal renderer running. Um, you may have seen that when I was, when I was out there. <laughs> uh, so funny story about Bitcoin mining. They didn't have SHA-256 as a, a library function. So I, so I found an implementation and I built it for the Mac Plus and I ran it. So this um, a, a typical Bitcoin mining rig runs at some number of giga hashes per second. That's how many billion SHA-256 computations it does. The Mac Plus original hardware does 20 hashes a second. <laughs> so, so now you know. Um, uh, and a dev world quiz system? Well, you could have asked Tony. Jeez. <laughs> um, demo time. So let's see. OK, here we have some emulators. Here's Mini VMAC Original. You can just go Control M. Oh, yeah. Control M for magnify. Control F for full screen. Here's. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'm just going to try and hide the controls there. There we go. So here's the first thing I wrote was a Mandelbrot generator. This emulator is running in full speed, as in all out. If I put the speed back to uh, 1x speed, you can actually watch the pixels draw any second now. There we go. <laughs> back to all out, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, there's a few other Retro 68 demo programs that comes with two um, ray traces. So that's, again, all out speed and like original speed it does this and I had it rendering um, on the actual hardware back when it was working uh, outside before it died um, so yeah that was, that was that um, so yeah that's really cool and I built a game uh, it's called a Man picks up some lines it's a reference to my uh, webcomic so you, you know use IJKL and you like walk this little stick figure around picking up some limes it's great so how does that work well Let's get out of that. I'll go over to the um, Macintosh 2 emulator here, um, the Mini VMAC beta. So in each case, I made some resources um, using ResEdit. Um, so here's an example here. So in ResEdit, I made um, an icon, a bunch of icon resources. Now ResEdit knows how to join all these together correctly, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, I drew this. I just drew it in ResEdit. It's great. Um, and this pic is where all the sprites are from. And um, instead of drawing that in ResEdit, because you can't, I fired up good old Clarisworks and did it there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you can copy and paste out of um, ClarisWorks into ResEdit. Okay, so once you have, uh, once you, oh, oops, I can I command queued a bit too much. Okay, so once you have a resource, uh, a file with just a bunch of resources in it, you need to get those resources back out into the operating system that you're running under, right, into real macOS, which isn't that friendly with resource forks. So what you do is you can, um, I was going to bin this to demonstrate it, Take the uh, resource file, dump it on Mac, good old Mac binary. Now I've got a bin file. Dump that on the mini vmac exporter. And it offers me a place, you know, where should I save this file? So, um, so let's pretend okay. I did that. And then over in Visual Studio Code, here's the source code for, that, you, that you need for um, the game. So. I'm just going to full screen that. Oh, no, not find. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm looking up. Okay. So, uh, so there's a bunch of C code, as you can see. Um, there's, I've uploaded this. Um, if I'm, I'll go link to it in a second. Um, so that's not the important part, though. The important part I want to point out, though, is there's the Mac binary um, resource file. And you just include it in a CMake declaration like this. It's uh, Retro 68 makes it super easy to just do this. Okay. So, back over here. One more thing. I know I'm out of time. I, I, I'm going to wrap it up though. So here's the family of Macintoshes that I had before, and there's proof that the Mac Plus was working. Because <laughs> um, that's a video. Um, it's actually making some noise. The um, Macintosh Color Classic is making the most noise because it's the biggest fan. Uh, it also has a hard drive in it. But that's not all the Macs I have. Here's a PowerBook D3 and a G4. Uh, and there's my Mac, Mac Pro. And so that's actually not all the Macs I have. Well, there's a MacBook and a MacBook, this MacBook Pro. And if I'm like serious, then I'll actually include the uh, Airport Extreme. Ah, so the Color Classic is called a uh, Mystic. It's not a Pokemon Go reference. It's actually um, a, code, a code name they use for when you take the original logic board out of a Color Classic and you replace it with a performer, um, like a much better and faster logic board. In this case, I actually managed to get this Color Classic with this board in it already. But that's not enough. That's really not enough. I need more Macintoshes. I just have to buy, no, hang on. I made a keyboard cable and a battery and I got this working. So introducing Macintosh Tiny. <laughs> nope. So what, what is it? Well, it, it's this big. Um, it's got a little five-inch touchscreen. It's based on a Raspberry Pi, and it runs Basilisk 2 emulator. So, um, and it's made of balsa wood, 100% Australian grown, uh, plantation grown. <laughs> you know it's good for the environment. <laughs> okay, uh, that's it. And uh, you can find all the links to various stuff on this. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you.